Book 9. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, O great Alcinous, preeminent among all people, surely indeed it is a good thing to listen to a singer such as this one before us, who is like the gods in his singing, for I think there is no occasion accomplished that is more pleasant than when festivity holds sway among all the populace, and the feasters up and down the houses are sitting in order and listening to the singer, and beside them the tables are loaded with bread and meats. And from the mixing bowl the wine steward draws the wine and carries it about and fills the cups. This seems to my own mind to be the best of occasions. But now your wish was inclined to ask me about my mournful sufferings, so that I must mourn and grieve even more. What then shall I recite to you first of all, what leave till later? Many are the sorrows the gods of the sky have given me. Now first I will tell you my name, so that all of you may know me, and I hereafter, escaping the day without pity, be your friend and guest, though the home where I live is far away from you. I am Odysseus son of Laertes, known before all men for the study of crafty designs, and my fame goes up to the heavens. I am at home in sunny Ithaca. There is a mountain there that stands tall, leaf-trembling Neritos, and there are islands settled around it, lying one very close to another. There is Dulition and same, wooded Zakynthos, but my island lies low and away, last of all on the water toward the dark, with the rest below facing east and sunshine, a rugged place, but a good nurse of men, for my part one cannot think of any place sweeter on earth to look at. For in truth Calypso, shining among divinities, kept me with her in her hollow caverns, desiring me for her husband, and so likewise Ai and Circe the guileful detained me beside her in her halls, desiring me for her husband, but never could she persuade the heart within me. So it is that nothing is more sweet in the end than country and parents ever, even when far away one lives in a fertile place, when it is in alien country, far from his parents. But come, I will tell you of my voyage home with its many troubles, which Zeus inflicted on me as I came from Troy land. From Ilion the wind took me and drove me ashore at Ismaros by the Caconians. I sacked their city and killed their people, and out of their city taking their wives and many possessions we shared them out, so none might go cheated of his proper portion. There I was for the light foot and escaping, and urged it, but they were greatly foolish and would not listen, and then and there much wine was being drunk, and they slaughtered many sheep on the beach, and lumbering horn-curved cattle. But meanwhile the Caconians went and summoned the other Caconians, who were their neighbours living in the inland country, more numerous and better men, well skilled in fighting men with horses, but knowing too at need the battle on foot. They came at early morning, like flowers in season or leaves, and the luck that came our way from Zeus was evil, to make us unfortunate, so we must have hard pains to suffer. Both sides stood and fought their battle there by the running ships, and with bronze-headed spears they cast at each other, and as long as it was early and the sacred daylight increasing, so long we stood fast and fought them off, though there were more of them, but when the sun had gone to the time for unyoking of cattle, then at last the Caconians turned the Achaeans back and beat them, and out of each ship six of my strong-grieved companions were killed, but the rest of us fled away from death and destruction. From there we sailed on further along, glad to have escaped death, but grieving still at heart for the loss of our dear companions. Even then I would not suffer the flight of my oar-swept vessels until a cry had been made three times for each of my wretched companions, who died there in the plain, killed by the Caconians. Cloud-gathering Zeus drove the north wind against our vessels in a supernatural storm, and huddled under the cloud scuds land alike and the great water. Night sprang from heaven. The ships were swept along yawing down the current, the violence of the wind ripped our sails into three and four pieces. These then, in fear of destruction, we took down and stowed in the ship's hulls, and rowed them on ourselves until we had made the mainland. There for two nights and two days together we lay up, for pain and weariness together eating our hearts out. But when the fair-haired dawn in her rounds brought on the third day, we, setting the masts upright, and hoisting the white sails on them, sat still, and let the wind and the steersmen hold them steady. And now I would have come home unscathed to the land of my fathers, but as I turned the hook of Maliae, the sea and current and the north wind beat me off course, and drove me on past Kithara. Nine days then I was swept along by the force of the hostile winds on the fishy sea, but on the tenth day we landed in the country of the lotus eaters, who live on a flowering food, and there we set foot on the mainland, and fetched water, and my companions soon took their supper there by the fast ships. But after we had tasted of food and drink, then I sent some of my companions ahead, telling them to find out what men, eaters of bread, might live here in this country. I chose two men, and sent a third with them, as a herald. 
My men went on and presently met the lotus eaters, nor did these lotus eaters have any thoughts of destroying our companions, but they only gave them lotus to taste of. But any of them who ate the honey sweet fruit of lotus was unwilling to take any message back, or to go away, but they wanted to stay there with the lotus eating people, feeding on lotus, and forget the way home. I myself took these men back weeping, by force, to where the ships were, and put them aboard under the rowing benches and tied them fast, then gave the order to the rest of my eager companions to embark on the ships in haste, for fear someone else might taste of the lotus and forget the way home, and the men quickly went aboard and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order dashed the oars in the grey sea. From there, grieving still at heart, we sailed on further along, and reached the country of the lawless outrageous Cyclopes who, putting all their trust in the immortal gods, neither plow with their hands nor plant anything, but all grows for them without seed planting, without cultivation, wheat and barley and also the grapevines, which yield for them wine of strength, and it is Zeus rain that waters it for them. These people have no institutions, no meetings for councils, rather they make their habitations in caverns hollowed among the peaks of the high mountains, and each one is the law for his own wives and children, and cares nothing about the others. There is a wooded island that spreads, away from the harbour, neither close into the land of the Cyclopes nor far out from it, forested. Wild goats beyond number breed there, for there is no coming and going of humankind to disturb them, nor are they visited by hunters, who in the forest suffer hardships as they haunt the peaks of the mountains, neither again is it held by herded flocks, nor farmers, but all its days, never plowed up and never planted, it goes without people and supports the bleating wild goats. For the Cyclopes have no ships with cheeks of vermilion, nor have they builders of ships among them, who could have made them strong-benched vessels, and these if made could have run them sailings to all the various cities of men, in the way that people cross the sea by means of ships and visit each other, and they could have made this island a strong settlement for them. For it is not a bad place at all, it could bear all crops in season, and there are meadow lands near the shores of the grey sea, well watered and soft, there could be grapes grown there endlessly, and there is smooth land for plowing, men could reap a full harvest always in season, since there is very rich subsoil. Also there is an easy harbour, with no need for a hawser nor anchor stones to be thrown ashore nor cables to make fast, one could just run ashore and wait for the time when the sailors' desire stirred them to go and the right winds were blowing. Also at the head of the harbour there runs bright water, spring beneath rock, and there are black poplars growing around it. There we sailed ashore, and there was some god guiding us in through the gloom of the night, nothing showed to look at, for there was a deep mist around the ships, nor was there any moon showing in the sky, but she was under the clouds and hidden. There was none of us there whose eyes had spied out the island, and we never saw any long waves rolling in and breaking on the shore, but the first thing was when we beached the well-benched vessels. Then after we had beached the ships we took all the sails down, and we ourselves stepped out onto the break of the sea beach, and there we fell asleep and waited for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, we made a tour about the island, admiring everything there, and the nymphs, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis, started the hill-roving goats our way for my companions to feast on. At once we went and took from the ship's curved bows and javelins with long sockets, and arranging ourselves in three divisions cast about, and the god granted us the game we longed for. Now there were twelve ships that went with me, and for each one nine goats were portioned out, but I alone had ten for my portion. So for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine, for the red wine had not yet given out in the ships, there was some still left, for we all had taken away a great deal in storing jars when we stormed the Caconian sacred citadel. We looked across at the land of the Cyclopes, and they were nearby, and we saw their smoke and heard sheep and goats bleating. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then we lay down to sleep along the break of the seashore, but when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I held an assembly and spoke forth before all, the rest of you, who are my eager companions, wait here, while I, with my own ship and companions that are in it, go and find out about these people, and learn what they are, whether they are savage and violent, and without justice, or hospitable to strangers and with minds that are godly. So speaking I went aboard the ship and told my companions also to go aboard, and to cast off the stern cables, and quickly they went aboard the ship and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order dashed the oars in the grey sea. But when we had arrived at the place, which was nearby, there at the edge of the land we saw the cave, close to the water, high, and overgrown with laurels, and in it were stabled great flocks, sheep and goats alike, and there was a fenced yard built around it with a high wall of grubbed-out boulders and tall pines and oaks with lofty foliage. 
Inside there lodged a monster of a man, who now was herding the flocks at a distance away, alone, for he did not range with others, but stayed away by himself, his mind was lawless, and in truth he was a monstrous wonder made to behold, not like a man, an eater of bread, but more like a wooded peak of the high mountain seen standing away from the others. At that time I told the rest of my eager companions to stay where they were beside the ship and guard it. Meanwhile I, choosing out the twelve best men among my companions, went on, but I had with me a goatskin bottle of black wine, sweet wine, given me by Maron, son of Euanth and priest of Apollo, who bestrides his Maros, he gave it because, respecting him with his wife and child, we saved them from harm. He made his dwelling among the trees of the sacred grove of Phoebos Apollo, and he gave me glorious presents. He gave me seven talents of well-wrought gold, and he gave me a mixing bowl made all of silver, and gave along with it wine, drawing it off in storing jars, twelve in all. This was a sweet wine, unmixed, a divine drink. No one of his servants or thralls that were in his household knew anything about it, but only himself and his dear wife and a single housekeeper. Whenever he drank this honey-sweet red wine, he would pour out enough to fill one cup, then twenty measures of water were added, and the mixing bowl gave off a sweet smell, magical, then would be no pleasure in holding off. Of this wine I filled a great wineskin full, and took two provisions in a bag, for my proud heart had an idea that presently I would encounter a man who was endowed with great strength, and wild, with no true knowledge of laws or any good customs. Lightly we made our way to the cave, but we did not find him there, he was off herding on the range with his fat flocks. We went inside the cave and admired everything inside it. Baskets were there, heavy with cheeses, and the pens crowded with lambs and kids. They had all been divided into separate groups, the firstlings in one place, and then the middle ones, the babies again by themselves and all his vessels, milk pails and pans, that he used for milking into, were running over with whey. From the start my companion spoke to me and begged me to take some of the cheeses, come back again, and the next time to drive the lambs and kids from their pens, and get back quickly to the ship again, and go sailing off across the salt water, but I would not listen to them, it would have been better their way, not until I could see him, see if he would give me presents. My friends were to find the sight of him in no way lovely. There we built a fire and made sacrifice, and helping ourselves to the cheeses we ate and sat waiting for him inside, until he came home from his herding. He carried a heavy load of dried out wood, to make a fire for his dinner, and threw it down inside the cave, making a terrible crash, so in fear we scuttled away into the cave's corners. Next he drove into the wide cavern all from the fat flocks that he would milk, but he left all the male animals, billy goats and rams, outside in his yard with the deep fences. Next thing, he heaved up and set into position the huge door stop, a massive thing, no twenty-two of the best four-wheeled wagons could have taken that weight off the ground and carried it, such a piece of sky-towering cliff that was he set over his gateway. Next he sat down and milked his sheep and his bleating goats, each of them in order, and put lamb or kid under each one to suck, and then drew off half of the white milk and put it by in baskets made of wickerwork, stored for cheeses, but let the other half stand in the milk pail so as to have it to help himself to and drink from, and it would serve for his supper. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, at last he lit the fire, and saw us, and asked us a question, strangers, who are you? From where do you come sailing over the watery ways? Is it on some business, or are you recklessly roving as pirates do, when they sail on the salt sea and venture their lives as they wander, bringing evil to alien people? He spoke, and the inward heart in us was broken in terror of the deep voice and for seeing him so monstrous, but even so I had words for an answer, and I said to him, We are Achaeans coming from Troy, beaten off our true course by winds from every direction across the great gulf of the open sea, making for home, by the wrong way, on the wrong courses. So we have come. So it has pleased Zeus to arrange it. We claim we are of the following of the son of Atreus, Agamemnon, whose fame now is the greatest thing under heaven, such a city was that he sacked and destroyed so many people, but now in turn we come to you and are suppliants at your knees, if you might give us a guest present or otherwise some gift of grace, for such is the right of strangers. Therefore respect the gods, O best of men. We are your suppliants, and Zeus the guest god, who stands behind all strangers with honours due them, avenges any wrong towards strangers and suppliants. So I spoke, but he answered me in pitiless spirit, Stranger, you are a simple fool, or come from far off, when you tell me to avoid the wrath of the gods or fear them. 
The Cyclopes do not concern themselves over Zeus of the Aegis, nor any of the rest of the blessed gods, since we are far better than they, and for fear of the hate of Zeus I would not spare you or your companions either, if the fancy took me otherwise. But tell me, so I may know, where did you put your well-made ship when you came? Nearby or far off? So he spoke, trying me out, but I knew too much and was not deceived, but answered him in turn, and my words were crafty, Poseidon, shaker of the earth, has shattered my vessel. He drove it against the rocks on the outer coast of your country, cracked on a cliff, it is gone, the wind on the sea took it, but I, with these you see, got away from sudden destruction. So I spoke, but he in pitiless spirit answered nothing, but sprang up and reached for my companions, caught up two together and slapped them, like killing puppies, against the ground, and the brains ran all over the floor, soaking the ground. Then he cut them up limb by limb and got supper ready, and like a lion reared in the hills, without leaving anything, ate them, entrails, flesh and the marrowy bones alike. We cried out aloud and held our hands up to Zeus, seeing the cruelty of what he did, but our hearts were helpless. But when the Cyclops had filled his enormous stomach, feeding on human flesh and drinking down milk unmixed with water, he lay down to sleep in the cave sprawled out through his sheep. Then I took counsel with myself in my great-hearted spirit to go up close, drawing from beside my thigh the sharp sword, and stab him in the chest, where the midriff joins on the liver, feeling for the place with my hand, but the second thought stayed me, for there we too would have perished away in sheer destruction, seeing that our hands could never have pushed from the lofty gate of the cave the ponderous boulder he had propped there. So morning we waited, just as we were, for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, he lit his fire, and then set about milking his glorious flocks, each of them in order, and put lamb or kid under each one. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, again he snatched up two men, and prepared them for dinner, and when he had dined, drove his fat flocks out of the cavern, easily lifting off the great door stone, but then he put it back again, like a man closing the lid on a quiver. And so the Cyclops, whistling loudly, guided his fat flocks to the hills, leaving me there in the cave mumbling my black thoughts of how I might punish him, how Athene might give me that glory. And as I thought, this was the plan that seemed best to me. The Cyclops had lying there beside the pen a great bludgeon of olive wood, still green. He had cut it so that when it dried out he could carry it about, and we looking at it considered it to be about the size for the mass of a cargo carrying broad black ship of twenty oars which crosses the open sea, such was the length of it, such the thickness, to judge by looking. I went up and chopped a length of about a fathom, and handed it over to my companions and told them to shave it down, and they made it smooth, while I standing by them sharpened the point, then put it over the blaze of the fire to harden. Then I put it well away and hid it under the ordure which was all over the floor of the cave, much stuff lying about. Next I told the rest of the men to cast lots, to find out which of them must endure with me to take up the great beam and spin it in Cyclops I when sweet sleep had come over him. The ones drew it whom I myself would have wanted chosen, four men, and I myself was the fifth, and allotted with them. With the evening he came back again, herding his fleecy flocks, but drove all his fat flocks inside the wide cave at once, and did not leave any outside in the yard with the deep fence, whether he had some idea, or whether a god so urged him. When he had heaved up and set in position the huge door stop, next he sat down and started milking his sheep and his bleating goats, each of them in order, and put lamb or kid under each one. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, again he snatched up two men and prepared them for dinner. Then at last I, holding in my hands an ivy bowl full of the black wine, stood close up to the Cyclops and spoke out, Here, Cyclops, have a drink of wine, now you have fed on human flesh, and see what kind of drink our ship carried inside her. I brought it for you, and it would have been your libation had you taken pity and sent me home, but I cannot suffer your rages. Cruel, how can any man come and visit you ever again, now you have done what has no sanction? So I spoke, and he took it and drank it off, and was terribly pleased with the wine he drank and questioned me again, saying, Give me still more, freely, and tell me your name straightway now, so I can give you a guest present to make you happy. For the grain-giving land of the Cyclopes also yields them wine of strength, and it is Zeus' rain that waters it for them, but this comes from where ambrosia and nectar flow in abundance. So he spoke, and I gave him the gleaming wine again. Three times I brought it to him and gave it to him, three times he recklessly drained it, but when the wine had got into the brains of the Cyclops, then I spoke to him, and my words were full of beguilement, Cyclops, you ask me for my famous name. I will tell you then, but you must give me a guest gift as you have promised. Nobody is my name. 
My father and mother call me nobody, as do all the others who are my companions. So I spoke, and he answered me in pitiless spirit, Then I will eat nobody after his friends, and the others I will eat first, and that shall be my guest present to you. He spoke and slumped away and fell on his back, and lay there with his thick neck crooked over on one side, and sleep who subdues all came on and captured him, and the wine gurgled up from his gullet with gobs of human meat. This was his drunken vomiting. Then I shoved the beam underneath a deep bed of cinders, waiting for it to heat, and I spoke to all my companions in words of courage, so none should be in a panic, and back out, but when the beam of olive, green as it was, was nearly at the point of catching fire and glowed, terribly incandescent, then I brought it close up from the fire and my friends about me stood fast. Some great divinity breathed courage into us. They seized the beam of olive, sharp at the end, and leaned on it into the eye, while I from above leaning my weight on it twirled it, like a man with a brace and bit who bores into a ship timber, and his men from underneath, grasping the strap on either side whirl it, and it bites resolutely deeper. So seizing the firepoint hardened timber we twirled it in his eye, and the blood boiled around the hot point, so that the blast and scorch of the burning ball singed all his eyebrows and eyelids, and the fire made the roots of his eye crackle. As when a man who works as a blacksmith plunges a screaming great axe blade or plane into cold water, treating it for temper, since this is the way steel is made strong, even so Cyclops I sizzled about the beam of the olive. He gave a giant horrible cry and the rocks rattled to the sound, and we scuttled away in fear. He pulled the timber out of his eye, and it blubbered with plenty of blood, then when he had frantically taken it in his hands and thrown it away, he cried aloud to the other Cyclopes, who live around him in their own caves along the windy pinnacles. They hearing him came swarming up from their various places, and stood around the cave and asked him what was his trouble, why, Polyphemos, what do you want with all this outcry through the immortal night and have made us all thus sleepless? Surely no mortal against your will can be driving your sheep off. Surely none can be killing you by force or treachery? Then from inside the cave strong Polyphemos answered, good friends, nobody is killing me by force or treachery. So then the other speaking in winged words gave him an answer, if alone as you are none uses violence on you, why, there is no avoiding the sickness sent by great Zeus, so you had better pray to your father, the Lord Poseidon. So they spoke as they went away, and the heart within me laughed over how my name and my perfect planning had fooled him. But the Cyclops, groaning aloud and in the pain of his agony, felt with his hands, and took the boulder out of the doorway, and sat down in the entrance himself, spreading his arms wide, to catch anyone who tried to get out with the sheep, hoping that I would be so guileless in my heart as to try this, but I was planning so that things would come out the best way, and trying to find some release from death, for my companions and myself too, combining all my resource and treacheries, as with life at stake, for the great evil was very close to us. And as I thought, this was the plan that seemed best to me. There were some male sheep, rams, well nourished, thick and fleecy, handsome and large, with a dark depth of, of wool. Silently I caught these and lashed them together with pliant willow withes, where the monstrous cyclops lawless of mind had used to sleep. I had them in threes, and the one in the middle carried a man, while the other two went on each side, so guarding my friends. Three rams carried each man, but as for myself, there was one ram, far the finest of all the flock. This one I clasped around the back, snuggled under the wool of the belly, and stayed there still, and with a firm twist of the hands an enduring spirit clung fast to the glory of this fleece, unrelenting. So we grieved for the time and waited for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then the male sheep hastened out of the cave, toward pasture, but the ewes were bleating all through the pens unmilked, their udders ready to burst. Meanwhile their master, suffering and in bitter pain, felt over the backs of all his sheep, standing up as they were, but in his guilelessness did not notice how my men were fastened under the breasts of his fleecy sheep. Last of all the flock the ram went out of the doorway, loaded with his own fleece, and with me, and my close counsels. Then, feeling him, powerful Polyphemo spoke a word to him, My dear old ram, why are you thus leaving the cave last of the sheep? Never in the old days were you left behind by the flock, but long striding, far ahead of the rest would pasture on the tender bloom of the grass, be first at running rivers, and be eager always to lead the way first back to the sheepfold at evening. Now you are last of all. Perhaps you are grieving for your master's eye, which a bad man with his wicked companions put out, after he had made my brain helpless with wine, this nobody, who I think has not yet got clear of destruction. 
if only you could think like us and only be given a voice, to tell me where he is skulking away from my anger, then surely he would be smashed against the floor and his brains go spattering all over the cave to make my heart lighter from the burden of all the evils this niddering nobody gave me. So he spoke, and sent the ram along from him, outdoors, and when we had got a little way from the yard and the cavern, first I got myself loose from my ram, then set my companions free, and rapidly then, and with many a backward glance, we drove the long striding sheep, rich with fat, until we reached our ship, and the sight of us who had escaped death was welcome to our companions, but they began to mourn for the others, only I would not let them cry out, but with my brows nodded to each man and told them to be quick and to load the fleecy sheep on board our vessel and sail out on the salt water. Quickly they went aboard the ship and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order dashed the oars in the grey sea. But when I was as far from the land as a voice shouting carries, I called out aloud to the Cyclops, taunting him, Cyclops, in the end it was no weak man's companions you were to eat by violence and force in your hollow cave, and your evil deeds were to catch up with you, and be too strong for you, hard one, who dared to eat your own guests in your own house, so Zeus and the rest of the gods have punished you. So I spoke, and still more the heart in him was angered. He broke away the peak of a great mountain and let it fly, and threw it in front of the dark proud ship by only a little, it just failed to graze the steering oar's edge, but the sea washed up in the splash as the stone went under, the tidal wave it made swept us suddenly back from the open sea to the mainland again, and forced us on shore. Then I caught up in my hands the very long pole and pushed her clear again, and urged my companions with words, and nodding with my head, to throw their weight on the oars and bring us out of the threatening evil, and they leaned on and rowed hard. But when we had cut through the sea to twice the previous distance, again I started to call to Cyclops, but my friends about me checked me, first one then another speaking, trying to soothe me, hard one, why are you trying once more to stir up this savage man, who just now threw his missile in the sea, forcing our ship to the land again, and we thought once more we were finished, and if he had heard a voice or any one of us speaking, he would have broken all our heads and our ship's timbers. With a cast of a great jagged stone, so strong is his throwing. So they spoke, but could not persuade the great heart in me, but once again in the anger of my heart I cried to him, Cyclops, if any mortal man ever asks you who it was that inflicted upon your eye this shameful blinding, tell him that you were blinded by Odysseus, sacker of cities. Laertes is his father, and he makes his home in Ithaca. So I spoke, and he groaned aloud and answered me, saying, Ah now, a prophecy spoken of old is come to completion. There used to be a man here, great and strong, and a prophet, Telemos, Euromo's son, who for prophecy was preeminent and grew old as a prophet among the Cyclopes. This man told me how all this that has happened now must someday be accomplished, and how I must lose the sight of my eye at the hands of Odysseus. But always I was on the lookout for a man handsome and tall, with great endowment of strength on him, to come here, but now the end of it is that a little man, niddering, feeble, has taken away the sight of my eye, first making me helpless with wine. So come here, Odysseus, let me give you a guest gift and urge the glorious shaker of the earth to grant you conveyance home. For I am his son, he announces himself as my father. He himself will heal me, if he will, but not any other one of the blessed gods, nor any man who is mortal. So he spoke, but I answered him again and said to him, I only wish it were certain I could make you reft of spirit and life, and send you to the house of Hades, as it is certain that not even the shaker of the earth will ever heal your eye for you. So I spoke, but he then called to the Lord Poseidon in prayer, reaching both arms up toward the starry heaven, hear me, Poseidon who circle the earth, dark-haired. If truly I am your son, and you acknowledge yourself as my father, grant that Odysseus, sacker of cities, son of Laertes, who makes his home in Ithaca, may never reach that home, but if it is decided that he shall see his own people, and come home to his strong-founded house and to his own country, let him come late, in bad case, with the loss of all his companions, in someone else's ship, and find troubles in his household. So he spoke in prayer, and the dark-haired God heard him. Then for the second time lifting a stone far greater he whirled it and threw, leaning into the cast his strength beyond measure, and the stone fell behind the dark proud ship by only a little, it just failed to graze the steering oar's edge, and the sea washed up in the splash as the stone went under, the tidal wave drove us along forward and forced us onto the island. But after we had so made the island, where all the rest of our strong bench ships were waiting together, and our companions were sitting about them grieving, having waited so long for us, making this point we ran our ship on the sand and beached her, and we ourselves stepped out onto the break of the sea beach, and from the hollow ships bringing out the flocks of the cyclops we shared them out so none might go cheated of his proper portion, 
but for me alone my strong grieved companions. Accepted the ram when the sheep were shared, and I sacrificed him on the sands to Zeus, dark-clouded son of Kronos, lord over all, and burned him the thighs, but he was not moved by my offerings, but still was pondering on a way how all my strong bench ships should be destroyed and all my eager companions. So for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then we lay down to sleep along the break of the seashore, but when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I urged on the rest of my companions and told them to go aboard their ships and to cast off the stern cables, and quickly they went aboard the ships and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order dashed their oars in the grey sea. From there we sailed on further along, glad to have escaped death, but grieving still at heart for the loss of our dear companions.